catch of fish, Jesus Christ calling his first disciples, Peter, James, and John. Just to refresh your memory, I'm going to read the last uh, four verses of the text. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. And For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And those are the words that we'll focus on today in today's sermon. In the name of Christ Jesus, dear fellow believers, how many times have you said, from now on? From now on, I'm not going to eat any dessert after supper. From now on, I'm not going to curse or swear, use foul language. Uh, from now on, I'm not going to bear a grudge. I'm just going to be the easiest going person ever and just forgive and forget. From now on, from now on, from now on. You know, we say that a lot, don't we? It's almost like uh, something you just, it just, it, it feels right to say that, doesn't it? From now on, you have these momentous times in your life, you get married, hey, from now on. Or um, the birth of a baby. Hey, from now on, hey, I'm a dad. From now on, I'm really going to be a faithful dad, a good dad. But because we're sinful people, a lot of times it doesn't happen. But today's text, Jesus says it. Jesus says, from now on. He says it to Peter. And it's very powerful. And it really did change Peter's life. It was the last time that Peter went fishing for fish, really. Well, there was that one time when he sort of was waiting for Jesus up in Galilee after Jesus rose from the dead. But that was just a very brief time. Basically, from now on, Peter, James, and John, they never went back to fishing, never went back to the fishing business again. And they really did fish for people. They fished for people and followed Christ the rest of their lives, from now on. Uh, so very powerful words when they come from Jesus. And today you are hearing those words. Those powerful words from Jesus. And he has you in mind when he says, from now on. From now on, you will fish for people and you will follow Christ. So we're going to take a look at that today. I thought it would be interesting to uh, wrap a sermon around that. From now on, from now on, we will fish. In parentheses, we all know it's not actual fishing. But we will fish for people and we will follow Christ. And there are some things that God wants us to do right now as we think of this particular juncture in our life and how important this is as we look forward. First of all, we are to now look at something, this miracle of Christ, we're to look at that. We are to listen to the gospel words of Jesus. And now we are to serve. We are to increase our service to God, just like Peter, James, and John were to increase their service to the Lord. So we'll take a look at the first part first. Uh, now look, look obviously at the miracle that is that Jesus performed. So this text follows on the heels of last Sunday's text. So if you were here last Sunday, you realize that Jesus Christ would, had left his adult home. So his childhood home was in Nazareth. And then when he becomes an adult, he's this adult carpenter. For some reason, he moves to Capernaum, which was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, or here it's called the Sea of uh, the Lake Genezareth, two names for the same body of water. 
So he leaves Capernaum. He had done a bunch of miracles there. The people begged him to stay. They didn't want him to leave. And then he says, no, I've got to preach the gospel in other towns too. So he works his way around the lake. He's going south. He's going west along the shore of the lake. He's just a little bit uh, a ways away from there. And he uh, is very popular. He had performed lots of miracles, as you remember from last week's sermon up in Capernaum. He had healed Peter's mother-in-law, and then later on that day, the whole town brought their sick people, and Jesus healed them. There were some demon-possessed people. Jesus healed them, too. So Christ was extremely popular at this particular point in his ministry. And so when he gets to those towns, then the crowd is pressing in on him. And you know what it's like. Uh, if you're in a crowded room, it's kind of hard to project your voice. It's hard to, to have eye contact with any, everybody in the room. So he thought it would be good to preach from a boat, which he did. He's preaching from Simon Peter's boat. And now the lesson is done, and he says to Simon Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. So those words for a catch are kind of important. So Jesus Christ, he doesn't say, put down your nets, we'll try to catch something. He says, we're going to catch something. All right? So at first, Peter doesn't quite believe Jesus. So he puts up a little bit of an objection here. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. So from what I understand, the Sea of Galilee is super clear water. Of course, I've never been there. But my parents were there and my sister was there. She said, yeah, it's really true. You go out to the Sea of Galilee and you're in 25 feet of water. You can look right down to the bottom. You can see the rocks down there. So what do you guys know about fishing lakes that have super clear water? Is, is the fishing any good during the daytime when the sun is out? Not really. You know, so you fish in the evening, you fish at night. That's actually the best time. And so Peter is referencing that. He says, look, you know, we fished all night. We haven't caught anything. And, and then credit Peter, though, because there must have been a little faith there, because he says, because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they did let down the nets, that was really a sight to see. And it's described in our text. When they had done so, they cut such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that the boats began to sink. So there's actually, you know, we tend to think of this as one miracle, but it's actually like three or four miracles. It's a miracle that uh, the fish would be up at the surface at that time of the day. It's because that's the way nets worked. Nets usually worked the surface. It's a miracle that the nets began to break, but they didn't break. It's a miracle that they filled both of these boats so full they were about to sink, but they didn't sink. See, so it's actually like three or four different miracles. And, and Jesus Christ is saying to Peter, James, and John, look, you guys are professional fishermen. Do you see what's happening here? Do you understand how by my miraculous power I am providing for you in an abundance? Look now. And from now on, acknowledge me. Acknowledge me as the Son of God. Acknowledge that I am the person that provides for you in an abundance. So that's the call for you today, too, and me. For us to take a look at our life and understand that Jesus is in control of our lifestyle. So you understand that, right? That of the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus is the one who's now in control of our lifestyle. Since he has died, since he's risen, since he's ascended into heaven, now the Bible says that Jesus is, is in control of all things. Everything in heaven and earth is under the control of Jesus. And he controls your lifestyle. So if you have a good lifestyle, you should credit that to Jesus from now on. So that's part of our faith, isn't it? So in the first article of the Creed, we say, I believe, of course, this is from Martin Luther, but we confess it as part of our, the, the teachings of the Lutheran Church. I believe that God still preserves me by richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, spouse and children, land, cattle, and all I own. And all this God does only because he's my good and merciful Father in heaven and not because 
I have earned or deserved it. So if we have a good lifestyle, it's not because of our own hard work and our own brains and things of that nature. It's because of God's grace in Jesus Christ. That's why we enjoy the lifestyle that we enjoy. So I thought about this the other day. So we were driving back um, from Rice Lake to Anago. It was on, uh, it was a Monday, it was Highway 29, and it was 10 below zero. And we were driving in our nice, comfortable Honda CRV with nice heat and everything. We're breezing by at 70 miles an hour. We're going to pass an Amish family that's uh, riding in their buggy. The temple is zero. And this Amish family, I looked in there and they're all, all bundled up. And I thought to myself, you know, am I any better than this Amish family? Am I, am I less sinful? Do I work harder than this Amish family? Obviously not. But Jesus has provided for me in, a, in an abundance. And can you say the same thing? Of course you can. That Jesus has provided for you in wonderful, wonderful ways. You look at your freezer when it's filled with red meat. From now on, acknowledge Jesus. He's the one that gave you all that red meat. When you look in your closet and you say, oh man, these, the closet's so jammed, I, it's time to take another trip for, uh, and donate some stuff to Goodwill. <laughs> From now on, give credit to Jesus for that. When you look at your 401k or IRA or the value of the home that you bought 10 years ago, you see that it's doubled or maybe even tripled. From now on, give credit to Jesus for that. From now on, from now on, from now on, we're going to look at the abundant way in which God has blessed us and give credit to Jesus, because that's who deserves that credit. There's something to look here at, and there's also something to listen to. This is maybe even more important than, than what we are going to see, uh, to listen. So Peter saw this miracle, and as a fisherman, he knew flat out it was a tremendous miracle. Now, he had seen other miracles, but for some reason didn't register with him. Now this miracle affects his livelihood. This is something Peter really understood. It was something that he had done all his life, the fishing thing. And, and now this miracle, this abundant catch of fish, this really registers with him. He's seeing the monetary value of this. He's seeing how his, his business uh, is enhanced by this. And he becomes aware, finally, that Jesus is God. So before that time, he thought Jesus was a prophet, a great teacher, but now he realizes that he's in the same boat as God Almighty. And instantly, he's very humbled by this. He says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. So Peter rightly understood that, you know, you have a sinner and you have a holy God that just doesn't, that's just not right for the two of them to be so close together. And so he says, go away from me, Lord. Peter's saying, I can't, I'm in the boat here. <laughs> I can't go any place quickly. But Lord, you could, you could fly away. You could just disappear. Go away from me, Lord, because we don't belong together. So uh, last summer, there was this man who had some good fishing, and he went out and he caught some fish, and then he, when he came home, he was really happy because his wife had cleaned up the garage for him. His wife had put everything in order and even vacuumed the floor with the shop vac. So the garage was spick and span, and he easily located his flay knives. He starts to flay the fish. And then, you know, he soaked them in a little bit of salt water, and then he put them, he wrapped them all up, put them in the freezer, and then it was, by that time it was pretty late at night, so he got a shower and he went to bed. And then the next day he went about his, his work business. And then about three days later, he catches a whiff. He goes, oh, there's this awful smell coming from the garage. What was it? He forgot, he forgot to throw away the fish guts. So those fish guts were in that nice, clean garage. And so he very quickly went out in the garage and he took the five gallon pail and he buried, it, buried the fish guts in the garden. You know, my point is, is that that's how it is with sinful people and holy God. It just doesn't, it just doesn't mix. It's not right for the two people to 
to the two entities to be together. And it's amazing, isn't it, that, that Jesus didn't leave. You know, Peter said, he, he begged, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Just go away. And it's amazing that Jesus didn't say, that sounds good. <laughs> I'm holy and you're sinful. Yeah, that sounds good. But he didn't say that, did he? Instead, he said, do not be afraid. Why did Jesus say that to Peter? Do not be afraid. Well, it's because Jesus had pardoned Peter. Jesus was thinking about his upcoming suffering and death on Calvary's cross and how his blood would wash away not only Peter's sins, but the sins of the whole world. And how now God is reconciled to this world of sinners. And that would include Peter. And it also includes you. Do not be afraid. So, are you afraid to meet God? That's going to happen to you within your lifetime. You are going to meet God. Way at the end of your lifetime, you're going to meet God. He's going to look in your eyes, and you're going to look in his eyes. Are you afraid of that? Are you afraid of that because of your sinfulness? When we just think about our sinfulness, yeah, it shakes us to the core. But when we remember these words of Jesus, when we listen now, when we listen, do not be afraid. Why does Jesus say, do not be afraid? It's because he is basing this on the, his own shed blood on Calvary's cross. It's because all of our sins, every single one of our sins, thought, word, and deed, it's all wiped out. Our sins from our youth all the way to the day of our death, it's all taken away. Are you afraid of meeting God? Do not be afraid. Listen now. And from now on, do not be afraid to die. Today we're having Holy Communion. And some of you will come up here for Holy Communion. And, you know, you'd be surprised that, uh, I know this as a pastor, maybe you don't know this, but there are some Christians that stay away from church on Communion Sundays. Why is that? Well, because they sense that it, when Communion brings you really, really close to God. And you're actually taking in that bread and that wine, the body and blood of Christ, and so there are some Christians that say, I just don't think that I'm quite good enough for that. I don't think my faith is good enough for that. I don't think my life is good enough for that. I don't think my thought life is good enough for that. And so they actually stay away on communion Sundays. Don't be like that. Don't be afraid. Listen now. From now on, let's not be afraid of God because of that wonderful gospel message that tells us that our sins are completely and totally forgiven. <clears throat> the way that all of this would show itself in the life of Peter was in his life of service. From now on, Peter and James and John would serve God in a different way, and I guess we could say a higher way. So we're going to consider that in the, in the third place, now serve. So I always think it's kind of fun with texts like this to just let your imagination go a little bit. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but let me share with you uh, what sometimes I do. <clears throat> so I like to kind of imagine the story turning out a little differently. And I'll, I'll, this one here, uh, forgive me if, uh, you know, I don't want you to think bad thoughts about me, but this is my imagination. So let's say it had turned out a little differently and Peter and Jesus were not so spiritual. And there was this big, huge draft of fish and uh, at the end of it, Peter says, Hey, Jesus, let's go into business together. This will be great. You know, you got the brains, I got the brawn, let's, like, let's make a lot of money, okay? You know, like the song goes. Uh, because, you know, you have sort of a fish finder mind, and you must have supersonic vision or something. And with all of my equipment and all my hard work, we can really make a lot of money. And if Jesus had not been so spiritual, he said, yeah, we, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's dominate the industry. But of course, that's not the way it worked because both Peter and Jesus had the right idea. They said, hey, no, you know, from now on, we're going to pursue this whole thing a little differently. From, from now on, things are going to change by way of service. So that's, what, that's where Jesus actually says those words. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything, and they followed him. So this was actually the call of Peter, James, and John into full-time ministry. Before this, they had been part-time followers of Christ. And now Jesus says, I want you to follow me full-time and, and, and go into full-time ministry. 
in, in a way, you are familiar with this because you've extended that call to me, your pastor. You say, Pastor Spouty, we want you to be a full-time fisher for people. We want you to lead us in that. And, and that's what we call, the, the sometimes we call that the divine call. But I think it's important for you to remember that all Christians really have a call in their personal ministry to share Christ and to follow Jesus Christ. All of you, you have a call. God has called you. From the, from the day that you first believed, God has called you to follow Christ and to be a fisher of men. And to follow Christ, you know, what does that mean? That simply means to learn about Christ. That's all it means, just to learn about Christ. We are to learn about his, his life, his death. We are to learn about his laws. We are to learn about how he forgives us. We are to learn about his, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, how he lives right now in heaven, in control of all things. We're just to learn about Christ. And as we learn about Christ, we learn that the focus of our life is to fish for people. To actually fish for people. So we, we know what that means. That, that means to use that gospel nut, to throw it out there so that other people can believe and be saved. So I think it's important for us to, to know that we're not in this alone. So Peter, James, and John, you know, those three disciples there, and they were work with Jesus. Later on, there would be 12 disciples. One turned out, you know, to be uh, unfaithful. But we are in this business of fishing for people with other people, the other members of your church. And most Christian churches kind of have this understanding that the members of the church do the inviting and the pastor does the teaching. I mean, it's not to be understood in absolute terms. But basically, that's it. The members of the church do the inviting and the pastor does the teaching. It's a, it's a lot easier, isn't it? to think in terms of, of what you're supposed to do, fishing for people, if you think, hey, I've got a team here. I don't have to do this all by myself. I have a team. I will simply invite my children and my grandchildren and my friends and my neighbors and maybe even some strangers. I'll just invite them to come to church and pastor and maybe a few others will do the teaching. You don't have to do that all by yourself. You have other people to help you. Also remember that not all the fish have to be the same. So when I go fishing, I'm always pretty happy to catch fish, period. I don't, they don't all have to be the same. They don't all have to be walleyes. They don't all have to be bluegills. They don't all have to be crappies. I'm just glad if I can catch a menagerie of fish. Okay? And so that's the way it is for Christians, too. When we go fishing for people, they don't have to be the same. They don't have, all have to be like us. They don't all have to be the same skin color. They don't all have to have the same education. They don't all have to have this solid Wells background. They don't all have to have kids who are well behaved and sit still in church. Okay? We, we don't have to reach out to only people who are like us. Fishing for people means fishing for all kinds of people. Okay, so there's a really a lot that you know I could say, but um, my 20 minutes are up. Okay, so you know the, the time to say amen is is quickly approaching. But in closing, I just want to remember you, remind you that when you say from now on, when you say from now on I'm going to stick to my diet, or from now on I'm not going to curse or swear, or from now on I'm not going to bear a grudge. A lot of times it doesn't work, does it? But today, Jesus says it to you. He says, from now on, you will fish for people and you will follow me. And those words are powerful. And those words are filled with God's grace. It should be very exciting for all of us, and is exciting, for us to hear these words from the lips of Jesus. From now on. Amen. Will the congregation please rise? Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Uh, those words are on the screen for us today. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, 
he hath not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified and the conscious pilot. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time, we'll offer the prayer of the church. And there have been two requested prayers. Uh, first one from Patty Lucian. She and her husband were on their way down to Florida. They spend a few weeks down in Florida. They came out of a little restaurant on their way, and she fell down and broke her ankle. So we want to pray for Patty. And then also for a little girl in Sunday school, her name is Ellie Malie. And she, uh, last time I, I called the mother, uh, which was last night, she had 102 fever. So we want to pray for her. So we pray. Uh, dear Lord, we ask you to bless and help uh, these people. Uh, help Patty Lucian, giving her a swift and full recovery from the accident that resulted in a broken ankle. Uh, we thank you that the injury was not more serious, and we especially ask that you bless her with uh, growing faith in Jesus, who has healed us from the injuries of sin, and who grants us the gift of eternal life, in which we'll have glorified bodies, which will never experience any accidents or suffer pain or any discomfort. We also pray for little Ellie Malik that you would break that fever and bring her back to full health so that she can participate in normal activities and come back to Sunday school. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The congregation can be seated for the order of the sacraments. And once again, the words are either in your hymnal or they are on the screen as well. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Receive our thanks as we worship you. 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We unite in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In the words of institution, these are the words that set aside these elements for use in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. peace with God, your sins are forgiven, and you may depart in peace. Amen.
thanks to God for the forgiveness that we've received in the word and also in the sacrament. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet you've given us in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until the day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessings of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Let's remain standing for the closing hymn. It's number 932, verse 2. So those of you that do need coffee to live, uh, please remember that and uh, maybe bring in a little extra the next time you go shopping. So um, just kind of a month down the line, Lent starts. So Lent starts late this year, you know, later than usual. Uh, Easter is, I think, um, well, it's, I don't know, when is Easter? April 17th? Okay, so, you know, it, that makes sense. But uh, just to kind of keep that on your radar, that we'll be having our Wednesday night uh, Lent services at 6.30 p.m., starting in March, okay, in one month. And then uh, for meetings this week, now, let's see, Jeremiah, I had on the calendar, it said Tuesday. Are you guys having a meeting on Tuesday already? I don't know. Um, seems like you just had one. So, um, yeah. anyway, I'll talk to Alan. it's on the calendar, and then uh, maybe let your community people know if there's been a change. But I know on Thursday, the council will meet at 4.30, and elders will meet at 6, and the managers will meet at 6.30. So, okay, those are the announcements today, and so I'll, I'll greet you at the double doors, and then um, Jen can kind of excuse you row by row. Have a great day in Christ. Um.